But Cleland has filed the motion to withdraw his most recent request for Richard Allen's mental health records. Uh, I, the question is why? Because he was pushing for it for quite some time, and all of a sudden it's like, eh, I don't need those now that we're getting... I mean, it, it, it seemed to kind of coincide with the fact that we have a date for the trial. He's suddenly like, I'm good. I don't need those. Uh, no, what the actual reason was is that uh, he made a, a grievous error in that he cited in his third motion... <laughs> for uh, Richard Allen's uh, mental health records, yeah. um, a ex parte uh, motion that was filed by the defense seeking funds for uh, various experts. And ex parte, uh, that means that the other side cannot see it. Okay, ah. so, so he, he, he cited, so he made this admission in in his pleading that he had read it and not only did he read it, but he put the the perspective expert that the defense was going to hire as far as a forensic psychologist to deal with the uh, jailhouse confessions, uh, put her in the pleading itself, and she hadn't even been retained. So the defense was obviously upset, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then he filed something a couple of days later stating that, oh, uh, oops, I, I shouldn't have read that. Uh, it was filed as public, which it wasn't. It just the, the defense verified uh, through the, the filing system that it was not filed public. It was sealed. Um, and, then how did he know, get it? That's the million dollar question. That is the million dollar question. Um, I mean, that pretty much verifies that, like, the, the, the cards are very much tilted in his direction of, hey, you get it from, and, and he's so s stupid or inexperienced that he's f making public <laughs> filings <laughs> on stuff he shouldn't even technically be seeing. I mean, what the hell? He, he absolutely should not have seen it. You, you know, I mean, like, that was, like, his entire I'm withdrawing that motion was like a mea culpa, but then, he, of course, he tried to blame it on the defense, saying that they filed it publicly, the defense, of course, responded in writing saying, no, not true. So, uh, yeah, it, it's the whole the whole case, man, uh, is just a mess, you know, and it's like I, I was relieved that they had filed the 70 day. I, I think you and I were talking about it. I, I didn't know what their position would be with respect to, to doing that just because of all the, the bullshit that's going on with the case in, yeah. in terms of can they be ready? Uh, you know, but but once they filed it, you know, it, it really changed the dynamic in a lot of different ways. Sure. You know what I mean? So, um, I mean, you know, the other thing that that we should probably discuss is the fact that, you know, we've got this hearing coming up on Monday mm -hmm. and it's actually two hearings. Uh, there's the the motion for contempt against the lawyers mm -hmm. rehashing the same things, the exact same things that were already discussed and litigated in front of the Indiana Supreme Court. Yeah. The Indiana Supreme Court, as a result, of course, reinstated them. Uh, he saw fit to decide to to spend his precious little time that he has left as we're 59 days away from trial preparing for a thing that doesn't matter. The Supreme Court all. already gave their what they decided on that. It's done. It, yeah. It's done. And, and, you know, it's like, I don't see what his end game is in, in again, when we're talking about a prosecutor's office that does not have the resources and, and uh, you know, just bodies to be able to help him to prepare. It's a very odd choice. Yeah. You know, for those that are, uh, you know, on the side of Alan's guilty uh, or for all of us that are on the side of, we want justice for the girls. It, it's a, it, it's disconcerting because he's choosing to spend his time on something that really is ancillary, mm -hmm. has has no bearing or impact on the trial itself, and, and frankly can wait. I mean, if he wants to bring this, bring it after the trial. Yeah. You know, I mean, like all of this stuff can wait until after <clears throat> trial, you know, and, and then, you know, if Gull's going to punish him, then she can punish him then. Yeah. It doesn't have to be done now. So. To me, tactically, he's making a, a, like a massive mistake by wasting because he's got to be preparing for this. Yeah, you know, the defense hired 
you know, an old war horse criminal defense attorney, Dave Hennessy, who, you know, is an Indianapolis guy and who's won a hundred murder trials. And he's, he's handling all of it while the two attorneys are preparing for trial, Yeah, you know? So it's just, when you look at it objectively, uh, no matter where you fall on this, it, it, it has to give you concern, especially in light of the underlying case and trying to get to the truth, you know? So yeah. it's a strange, strange decision on his part. It's, it's all very, uh, very strange. Uh, and, and we're still, uh, you know, uh, several days away from this trial as the time of this airing, probably around 50 some. Um, but uh, yeah. Hey, it's Tony Bruschi. If you like the podcast, be sure to like, subscribe, and press that bell so you don't miss any of our updates on the cases we're following for you right here at the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. And thanks.